Well, thank you very much. It's a, a great privilege to be here with you. Um, I confess I feel like I'm coming from the dark side of uh, traditional medicine where I'm usually giving my talk. But I'm very, very impressed with the, a lot of the quality of the work that's presented here and even more with uh, the incredible positive attitude um, that's presented here about forward-looking, uh, ready to accept changes in sort of sometimes what's been an ossified or calcified view of medicine. And certainly uh, I've shared some of that around uh, my work with testosterone over the last uh, 20 years. I've been doing this work in humans for 20 years, but I started doing testosterone work as an undergraduate at Harvard with lizards. I worked in a laboratory of David Cruz, who's a biologist now at University of Texas, then was at Harvard. And uh, we were putting pellets of testosterone into the brains of these lizards and seeing what effects they had. Some of the women in the audience may say that there's not much difference between lizards and humans. And you know what? <laughs> you might be right when it comes to testosterone. So uh, this talk is uh, entitled Testosterone Therapy in Men, the Next Big Thing in Medicine. You can decide whether it deserves a question mark or an exclamation mark at the end of it. Um, and what I want to do with you is take you through what we actually know about testosterone and look at some of the hurdles we've had towards accepting it in general medicine. I'll give you the punchline, which is that I believe that within five or ten years it's going to be reasonable and maybe we'll see it for every man over the age of 40 or maybe 50 um, to actually have a testosterone level that's checked and men are going to know this the same way that they may know their cholesterol level or their PSA level the way they do today. So here are my disclosures. I think they're available for you elsewhere as well. And if I can advance. So uh, let me start with a case. A 61-year-old physician comes to see me. Uh, his chief complaint is, I don't feel like myself. He's tired. <laughs> he does his best to read the New England Journal of Medicine, but he keeps falling asleep after dinner while he's doing it. Uh, he also has some erectile dysfunction, ED, and reduced libido. Uh, he doesn't care that much about the ED because, frankly, he doesn't have any interest in sex. Um, he's otherwise healthy. He has a total testosterone of 342, which in my hospital lab um, is normal and uh, was told by his own physician, primary care physician, that his testosterone was okay, so low testosterone really wasn't the issue for him. And the question for this fellow is, is there any role for testosterone therapy in this man? Now, if you look at his symptoms, there can be overlap with other things. Maybe he's just depressed. And if you're like me and a little bit of a political junkie, maybe he's just depressed because the election is over, you know, he's not getting his his, uh, his uh, Obama, McCain, Palin thing. But there's good news for him if that's the problem because there's a show, Dancing with the Stars, actually, that has a new couple that'll give him his fix. And uh, here it is. Yeah. Don't they look lovely? Um, so if we talk about testosterone, I think less for this group here, but certainly with mainstream medicine, there have been several obstacles that have really interfered with acceptance of um, the concept that men who are testosterone deficient deserve treatment. And those hurdles tend to come down to three different things, the main ones. Physicians will say, I think that the benefits have not been proven. I'm not sure what the guys are going to get out of it for sure. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion that uh, we academics have created around how to make the diagnosis. We've made it very complicated and people worry a lot about the risk of prostate cancer, which is an area I've done a lot of uh, my work with. They're afraid that if we raise testosterone, that there are a lot of men we know have um, occult or undiagnosed small prostate cancers. Maybe they're going to grow more quickly because there is this connection between testosterone and prostate cancer. So I want to tackle these and let's start first with what is the definition. So there's some different ones around but the one that I use that I think is reasonably widely accepted is that testosterone deficiency is a clinical syndrome. 
not a biochemical diagnosis, it's a clinical syndrome that has a characteristic set of symptoms or signs and it's associated with serum levels of androgens, usually we measure testosterone, below the range seen in healthy young men. So what's important about this is that blood tests alone aren't enough to make the diagnosis. Symptoms alone in general aren't enough to make the diagnosis. It's some ways that, that guys actually present. How prevalent is it? Well, if we're using testosterone levels in men in their 20s and 30s who are uh, healthy, and you look by decade, you find that the prevalence goes up increasingly with age. In orange, on the left bars are total testosterone levels. On the right is another measure of androgen uh, content, which is the free testosterone index. But even if you use the smaller one of those, we're talking about numbers that probably come up somewhere around the 20 to 25 percent prevalence range for men who are above 50. Uh, data from the FDA suggests that we're only really treating a very small percentage of men who are hypogonadal, which is another term for testosterone deficient. These data are from a few years ago. I think the numbers have increased somewhat now, but the numbers are still quite small. There are a lot of men with this problem. We're treating only a small fraction of them, and some of that is due to a lack of awareness of low testosterone as a concept, and then some of the hurdles or obstacles that I've just mentioned uh, to you. So here's part of the confusion then about who's a candidate. We have, if you've spent any time at all looking into this, researching it for yourself, if you've read the Endocrine Society guidelines that came out a couple of years ago, what you find is uh, not a whole lot of direction and a lot of complexity. We have all sorts of tests that you can do total testosterone, free testosterone, bioavailable testosterone, free androgen index. Some of the uh, lab reports will put out percent free testosterone, uh, percent of the whole. We have different thresholds that nobody seems to agree on. Less than 200 showed up in a New England Journal editorial a few years ago. 300 is what the Endocrine Society and the FDA uses. 348 or 350 came up from the International Society.